Where the heart doesn't lie. A COVID diary as the days blur and blend into one. He was a, a poor half-breed kid from small town Montana. His mother Irish Catholic, his father Native American Cheyenne. God by any other name could just as well be Wack and Tanker. From one he'd learned the sacrament of sacrifice. From the other the sanctity of natural creation. From both the grace of humility. Though much of his teenage years he'd spent battling for pride in the face of so much shaming for being a skinny half-breed four-eyes. That was the only racism he knew till he was drafted and posted to the still Jim Crow American South. 1966, no coloreds allowed. How about half and half? It opened up his mind to trying to understand apparently higher powers that chose to make no natural, moral, common sense at all. He left school at 16, academically undistinguished, no college. He was working for a logging company till, till he got the call caught up in the draft. He didn't resist, never crossed his mind. Though initially deferred as one why on medical grounds, potential hernia problem, a, a year later he was miraculously cured and reclassified A1 when the military decided it needed more boots on the ground, too many college deferments, anybody who could stand up straight. There was one guy in the platoon who couldn't even put his boots on the right feet without supervision. It was the giant rats. The pervasive rank odor reek of some local staple fermented fish sauce, the fetid smell of the jungle and swimming in sweat 24-7 that welcomed him to Vietnam. Within a month, he'd witnessed three of his platoon members maimed or killed outright. One lost an arm, another lost his brain skull-capped by flying shrapnel. The guy slumped forward, his bloodless skullcap bowl of brains nestling on the ground beside him. Another guy frazzled to a stick crisp by incoming mortar fire. Chaos and fear reigned, always pulsing beneath the surface of the most routine of chores. Not long after he'd resisted the insane urge to reach a hand into that bowl of brains, he, he found himself looking around for somebody, anybody. He could trust to, to guide him through this morass who more than just his mess rations, there was nobody. He was alone in this purgatory with hell skulking behind every corner. And at that moment, he became a fatalist, his word for it. He accepted his fate, was in the hands of a much higher power, far beyond his need to understand. Only God, Aka Wakantanka, who had given him life, could decide the time and manner of his death. It was the only way he could stay sane and, and fearless enough to function at all. And he's kept that faith to this day, 50 years on. His father had taught him to hunt deer for food, not sport, but only the dry doe never the buck or the fawn, to interfere with nature's procreative cycle, the ultimate blasphemic no-no in the eyes, the heart, and the omniscience of the great creator, the great spirit. Yet here he was in Vietnam, just one among so many bucks and fawns sent to a slaughterhouse to be picked off in their procreative prime as if there was some design to leave only the dry dough, soul, witness to nature's demise. It made no natural, moral, common sense. But who was he to judge? But who was he not to judge all these orders coming from a disordered mind? There was no sacrament of sacrifice going on, no respect for nature's creation but it did confirm for him the grace of humility, Wakantanka's tough love. To not know evil, you would never need to choose good. Free will is the backbone of faith. You don't abandon ship just because God's taking a nap. I was in love with this woman. She loved me, she said, but not always in that way. 
We'd been to a party together, me, her, and my best friend, gone back to her place afterwards. I was hoping I might stay the night, but after a while I knew that wasn't going to happen. We should leave, I told my best friend. He looked at me. I looked at her. She looked at my best friend. And I knew what was going to happen. I left. But as I was going down the stairs, my best friend was coming up the stairs, trembling. He was so afraid his woman might be with another man. And we both knew she was. Psychological warfare, battling for control of another's mind. You tell your best friend he's not your best friend anymore, but you don't tell him why. Why? What did I do? Did I do something wrong? He's already primed for weaponization. Can you lend me $20? I promise I'll give it back when we're best friends again. But what if we're never best friends again? You're so negative. You lend him $20. I already have a new best friend, but why? What did I do? If you don't know that by now, maybe you don't deserve to be anybody's best friend. I like a new bike. Want to swap? But you've got an old bike. You're so negative. I mean, do you really want to kill your granny? Well, you've got no answer for that. I'm, I'm just looking out for you, for me or my granny. You know, there's a pestilence afoot. Where? It's all over the TV. I don't watch TV anymore. See? You're so negative. What do you think is there for decoration? The informing soundtrack of our lives, edited highlights, fucked with my mind a lot more than my best friend ever did. But as kids, we'd both watch too much TV, so we were already fucking with each other's mind. Mass communication. The more massive it becomes, the more garbled and edited in the trickling down. Most kids never ask, who's doing the editing? Must be Jimmy Fallon. Did, did you see the latest? The latest what? The latest anything? It's all the rage. When trending becomes a rage, you know, there's some mass hysteria being let loose. Apparently, the human race has a racial issue. More likely, inhumanity has a racial issue, created a racial issue, foisted it on humanity to foster all manner of inhuman behavior. If, if somebody's not happy with their life, they'll always need somebody else to blame. The key is to make enough people unhappy with their life. It becomes a real issue. Inhumanity's inhumanity to humanity, to keep it always at war with itself, while inhumanity plays both sides and makes a killing. I never knew I was white, till I met a black guy. I just assumed I was a working-class Yorkshire kid from the wrong side of the tracks who spoke unrefined English. He was Jamaican from Jamaica, spoke unrefined Jamaican. I could barely understand a word he said, but I never once thought of enslaving him. It never crossed my mind. What makes me so special? But what if he tried to enslave you, said my best friend. But he didn't. But what if he had? But he didn't. We went for a beer, tried to understand each other, became best friends for a while till he went back to Jamaica and I went off to check out the rest of the human race. No particular issue I was aware of. What, what makes me so special? My mother always expected the worst. She'd lived through a war, she'd learned to expect the worst. But after she was told she'd won the war, life did not seem to get much better. You're either afraid of getting blown up or you're afraid of not being able to pay your rent. She was always being told that sacrifices must be made. I think she spent her whole life waiting to be sacrificed. Everybody has a story to tell. Your own edited highlights, the challenge, how to navigate your own narrative, head case, fairy tale, folk tale, or coin toss. In limbo till the penny drops, but maybe coin spinning waters run deepest, a lot deeper than the flip or the falling flat. Maybe, maybe it's the hanging in the balance that counts. If you're always too busy waiting for your story to unfold, maybe your real well-being's left hanging in the balance. Where there's movement, there may be hope, but only in your presence is your real well-being. I need to go Zen. I need to go Buddhist. I need to go something, anything that doesn't keep me hanging in the balance. I need a story. In which case, I need a plot, a conflict, a transformation, an evolution of past into future. I used to be a monkey. I used to be a Big Bang. I appeared from nowhere, so I must be going somewhere. Otherwise, 
I'm just hanging in the balance. It's out of my hands. Fate, destiny, karma, divine intervention, devilish interference. To get to heaven, to get to rest in peace, not to be down to hell. It all started in a little village. A baby was born, grew up to be a man. This happened and that happened and he died. And written on his tombstone, his epitaph, he hanged himself by his own lack of balance. He won the coin toss, he lost the coin toss, or the coin kept spinning, so in the end nothing was won or lost. Not much of a story, the charmless passage of a lazy snail, given the caprice of inhuman tread, so alarmed to live and so quickly dead, killed by a falling double-headed penny. So many stories to tell, it makes your head spin. New plots, forever unfolding in the active brain. Choose your weapon of choice to battle your outward limitations and stick to your guns. Your reality is only you can define it. The one best suits your outward limitations and, and keeps it in line with a general consensus. The world's in crisis. Or is it just me? Am I not being critical enough? Am I being too critical? 50-50 odds. Just be wary of falling double-headed pennies. We live in fear. We live in complacency. We live for convenience. We live for change, expand or go under. Growth must be the preliminary to death. Stasis is in the nature of hanging in the balance. Nature has an answer to every natural question. Where do I go from here? Well, let's flip a coin. Or study our horoscope. Let the stars decide. Beware of interruptions. Anticipate piñata-esque explosions. Remain tenacious and never be satisfied till somebody listens to you. Always take a break when at least one other person is busy. If your stomach's not churning, nothing wonderful will ever happen. Always build buildings that somebody else can stand inside. Set ball-rolling examples. Competing with yourself is pointless. Consistently check your own atmosphere and lighting scheme. It is your natural habitat. Nay, it is your leveraging into self-comfort. Demand nothing that isn't given freely. Insistently abate the desire to accumulate. Join in the moment. It is always hanging in the balance. Respond accordingly. So... So there we are, then. Get real and live and die in the process, which apparently was a satanic cult, possibly still is. Charlie Manson, the sons of Sam. Didn't they have a fascinating story to tell? You worry too much. You're going to worry yourself to death. My mum used to tell me that, especially around school exam time. She, she could feel my stress, my anxiety and fears of failing. Preconditioned reflex. If I did well, I would be rewarded. If I didn't do well, I would be ashamed of myself, and deservedly so, and would have to do better in future. Very Pavlovian, that school bell, eliciting a rapid response mechanism. Five minutes to get to your next class, otherwise more shaming. It seems ironic now that the apparently unstressed and anxious, fearless and shameless ones were who deems the ones who should be more ashamed of themselves and deserve not to have all the rewards they wouldn't get. Maybe they just refuse to worry themselves to death. Mind over what might really matter. Worrying yourself to death? I used to consider it just some voodoo, retrograde old wives phrase in, in lieu of facing up to modern medicine's diagnostic tools. Pavlov experimented with dogs, making them neurotic. Lots of bells and whistles to keep them in line, never knowing what was coming next. Feeding them stress and confusion, anxiety and fear of not being rewarded and being punished. He wanted to see if it would make them physically sick, and it did. In many instances, cancerous. It was groundbreaking stuff, especially should it work on humans too. But of course, that would be un inhuman to deliberately reduce humanity to the level of neurotic dogs in constant dread of being punished and rewarded and possibly sick to death from being ordered around all the time, always jumping to attention when duty calls, at ease only when duty permits. Basic training, your DNA in boot camp, the individual must surrender to the collective mandate if this war is ever to be won, but who decides who's fighting who and why? Did I sign up for this? I must have been out of my mind. 
As soon as you can be convinced, if you're just hanging out in your backyard alone, not doing anything in particular, not harming anybody, admittedly not helping anybody, no pain, no particular ecstasy, your head full of indefinably daydreaming imaginings, you don't need to analyze or troll for inspiration, no regrets, no expectations, you're obviously not living in the real world. You're already hooked up to the matrix, primed for weaponization, and the real world could pounce at any moment and arrest you for simply not taking part in it. He was just a kid from Leamington Spa, a sedately minor township in the Midlands of England. Now he's the man with the answer. Literally, that's the title of his latest book. If you, if you know what it is, hey, you may as well put it into print. David Icke, academically undistinguished. He left school at 15, no college, became a professional soccer player. An injury put an early end to that career, so he joined the BBC sports commentary team till, till a psychic told him he would go out on the world stage and reveal great secrets. Then a lightning bolt revelation hit him in the head on Machu Picchu. He saw dots before his eyes, and suddenly they all started connecting, and the rest is alternative history, apparently in a nutshell. I used to, I used to tell this Eskimo folk tale about a guy who got hit on the head with a lightning bolt, left him scarred, but now a great healer. The secret to his healing, he'd eat the sick person's shit till they got well again. Of course, eventually, he'd eaten up so much shit he wasn't feeling too good himself. He's, he's all but at death's door, lying on his bed, when this young man with a scar down his left cheek turns up, saying he's just been hit on the head with a lightning bolt. I've been expecting you, said the great healer, reaching down under the bed, pulling out his bedpan. So I made you some breakfast. I guess David Icke's eaten up enough shit in the past 30 years to have no doubts about his calling. He came to national nutjob prominence in the 1990s on a BBC talk show, implying the Queen was a shape-shifting lizard. Say goodnight, Gracie. Goodnight, Gracie. They're laughing at you, David. Not with you, chuckled the host. Ten or so years later, he returns to the same talk show. As a globe-hopping, many-volumed, already somewhat iconic, if hardly mainstream spokesman, spokesman for independent research into alternative history. And that same host suddenly looks like he's now eating his own demonstrably provincial sheep shit, though I doubt Mr. Ike has been allowed on the BBC again, except maybe as an alternative soundbite for rabidly would-be lunatic conspiracy theorists. I went to Leamington Spa once. My big brother lived there for a time. I was hitchhiking down to London, decided to pay my big brother a scattershot visit. But he wasn't there. Nobody was there. The house was empty. I slept in the shed before I passed on unrequited next morning. It, it was neither the first nor the last of the many times I didn't see him. Where's your big brother when you're not sure if you need him or not? By now, he's made it very clear he doesn't need me in his life. So I have to assume I don't need him either, so, so much for our bloodlines. Not, not sure if I offended him or he decided I was inhibiting his growth. I just know that Big Brother calls the shots. Sometimes I feel like I've been seeking a surrogate Big Brother ever since. I, I do get a regular Christmas card from his wife. He never signs it. I'm, I'm sure he, he doesn't keep a Christmas list, but neither do I. Not, not a very masculine thing to do, and I, and I assume he's still identifying as male, but we all know what assumptions do. They don't kill the cat. They just let it take care of its own well-being. Speaking of Big Brothers and absentee bloodlines... The human race is apparently on the verge of a great reset, a synthetic re-blooding in the name of brotherly love, would you believe? Tis a far, far better thing I do for somebody else than I ever did for myself. Our nature is so obviously out of control, and we only have ourselves to blame. We've used it and abused it for far too long. We need an injection of climactic purpose to prevent us from clotting up the planet and make it, making it unfit for human consumption. But no worries, Big Brother's got the answer to all our woes. Or this guy David Icke does. Huh? Will the real Big Brother stand up, please, and tell the truth? 
it used to be a TV game show when I was a kid. Three people claiming to be the same person. Only one is not lying. They're asked several questions by a panel. They're, then we all panel and view us together. We're all in this together. We have to decide who is telling the truth. The suspense is unbearable. It's a human polygraph test. All you have to go on is your own intuition. Doesn't always get it right. The odds are three to one. We can't tell a fake from an identity theft. Who are we to judge? Especially when it's all on TV. Maybe they're all lying, but hey, that's showbiz. I saw David Icke once, Ikey to his friends. I saw him live, delivering an eight-hour presentation. He took a short break in the middle, possibly more for the audience's benefit than his, though being human, he may need it to take a pee. Before this, the closest I'd been to being so unsquirmingly engaged and fascinated by a sole live performer was seeing the actor-storyteller Spalding Gray. He was just sitting at a table weaving his storytelling spell for over two hours. I emerged incredulous it could have been that long. Not that Mr. Ike considers himself a performer, nor actor, nor storyteller. He didn't write the stories, and they aren't stories anyway. They're occult history, very often served to the public as myth. He's just connecting the dots and plots. He never claimed to be a poet either, though, as he floats unscriptedly, eloquently across the proscenium, highlighting a variety of slide visuals, the consistency of certain symbology from ancient times, still ubiquitous in modern logos and gesture, there's definite poetry going on. With his informatively comprehensive interpretations of life, death and worlds within worlds, if he's a lunatic, then I'm a moron admiring a lunatic who seems to be teaching me how to be sane in an insane world. He's become like the elephant in many a conspiratorial chat room. To mention his name admits a favoured podcaster of mine who used to work with him. It could be an end of conversation. Slam dunk, pull the other leg too far down a rabbit hole. I don't want to know. May as well go home now. Kill me granny and dream the queen's not really a born-again shape-shifting lizard. Loss of credibility moment. My favoured podcaster chooses to keep his boots firmly on journalistic groundings and remain agnostically detached from any super ethereal evaporations. I mean, if you want to catch the ear of the average Joe skeptic, best to leave David Icke out of the picture. He's been so embedded, degraded and ridiculed in at least the UK's popular psyche as the ultimate nutter conspiracy theorist. Best to leave Mr. Icke out of the conversation. It's a bit like bringing up Jesus not as an expletive might, might immediately alienate all non-Christians. Not that David Icke is much of a conversationalist himself, at least not in his public moments. He just tells you what the answer is. Ask him a question, any question, dialogue over. He'll give you a full-length, intricate, dense, complicated, but at the same time supremely clear and articulated response. Next question, please. To accuse him of being a long-winded rambler, you may as well accuse an electrician of taking more than five minutes to rewire the whole house, because that's what he's attempting to do. Rewire up your whole house, which has been previously so stitched up by malevolent electricians. You either believe him or you don't. Hindsight does tend to edit, elaborate, or simplify. We're connecting our own dots into a into a pattern here. I had this, I had this acting teacher in New York City once, Bill Hickey. I'd never heard of him, but I was told he was somewhat of a legend in New York theatre circles. Seemed like a nice guy. Supportive, often to the point of being uncritical. He'd always bring his flask of coffee to class laced with alcohol, so, so I was told he had a bit of a reputation for that too. And he loved talking about himself. He'd never play a character, he'd say. He'd only play himself, let the script, the situation and the audience create the character. He'd recently made a movie with Jack Nicholson, me and Jack. Me and he'd anecdote one legend to another. He was living his own legend and creating it as he went along. But, but isn't everybody? I mean, it helps if you're in the public sphere, but even if you're not, 
Doesn't everybody want to leave a legacy? A story to be remembered by, if only in your own forgotten memory. Who knows anybody, really? Not even yourself. Only the story you tell yourself. Edited, elaborated, simplified. The rest, alternative history. A pattern to live by. Some people do it linear, in chronological order, rising through very particular ranks, becoming, becoming a man or woman to be reckoned with, building his CV, climbing a ladder to success and credibility, so anybody on the lower rungs will know why they look up to you. They, they could learn from you how to climb that ladder. You've righted all your wrongs. You've paid your dues. David Icke's paid his dues, deserves to be listened to. Documentedly predicting world affecting events, including the current situation, for years not prophecy, researched evidence of an agenda at work for centuries. To deny him that proof, to deny him that proof, you may as well deny everything you've ever seen or heard or read second hand, may not be anything but fanciful fabrications of the media. From ridicule and scorn. He's built himself an alternative mini-empire of followers, featured in the first live-stream million-listener independent podcast while, while he remains but an unprecociously now 69-year-old pot-bellied something of a cheeky chappy when he's not riled up, impassioned, ruining the evil that human beings have allowed to rule in this world. So obvious now to anyone with a brain cell left in the head. Anybody want to buy a used pumpkin? We need to choose our own ladder to get to that unused pumpkin. Our own version of what success is your choice. He's made his. Build your own ladder, grow your own pumpkins, create your own ranking system. Just don't suffer fools or malevolence gladly. They're too determined to choose that ladder for you and keep you on the lower rungs. This isn't a competition. It may not be a rehearsal, but neither is it an end product. If you believe it is, then you're always going to be settling for less, maybe even less than a used pumpkin or living in anticipation that there must be more. In fear, it may not be enough. What you have is what you get, and if you don't have much, well, that's all you have. How come they've got so much more? Possession is nine-tenths of the pumpkin. The other tenth is the law of the jungle, the paradigm of chaos. Though, though if you really studied jungle ecology, you'd realize it's the paradigm of order. So much life organically woven, active in one place. Nearly a square, a right angle, or a pyramid to be found. The circle, cycle of naturally being alive. But I am not an animal. I'm not an insect, I think. Therefore, I'm not a bug or an amoeba. I'm here to bring order out of my blubbery chaos. I need to build back better. It's what civilization is all about, keeping the creepy crawlies at bay. That, that's why God gave us plains and valleys and firmer footing. Well, somebody did. Maybe it was the Freemasons. Geometry is key to unlocking the secrets of order out of blubbery chaos. That's why you need to wear a mask. It symmetricizes your face. It's easier to calculate your square root. There's a theory. There's a theory that duality... Is the essential glue that makes the spirit manifest. Light and dark, thought and feeling, lull and hardy, Jekyll and Hyde, good and evil. It's the coil that generates the electricity of physical and mental activity. Direct current is dangerously disruptive. Am I, am I making this up? Maybe I'm making this up. But I, I don't know right from wrong. I can feel it in my blood and bones. It's, it's not something I've needed to be told. They can tell me I've added me sums up wrong, but they can't tell me I didn't intend to add them up right, and, and that's what really mattered. No intent to deceive. I, I could have cheated and sneaked a peek over Kevin Hancock's shoulder, because he always got his sums right, but I knew that was wrong. And I'd only be fooling myself. Though I might have got a pass, not a fail, success and failure. The key to finding your place in this world, if not the next. Cheats never beat, hey, pull the other leg, it's got a fucking politician on how to not be deceived in a world of edited highlights and confidence tricksters. Trust me, I got all my sums right. Well, did you now? Go to the head of the class. I'll go to the back of the class and enjoy my own hallucinations. When? is an hallucination not really happening. 
Well, it's not on TV. Have you ever seen yourself on TV and realised you are not hallucinating after all? Because you're really happening. Get real, Kathy Clatch, you're in it for the long COVID, hauling over the coals, an end to fossil fuels. They were only a, a hallucination anyway. Please tell me what is real, and I shall act accordingly. When hallucinations override your own perceptions, your organic occulturings are ripe for cancellation. Is anybody following me on Facebook? Friends, illegal aliens and golf links, lend me your caddy. I wish to go down the rabbit hole in one. I am not inanimate. I am a Walt Disney cartoon clone. Not, not long after I first came to America, living in New Haven, Connecticut, Working at Yale, I became friendly with his postgraduate philosophy student. We'd regularly bump into each other in an off-campus coffee shop, and we'd philosophise. He told me he was writing a book about skull and bones. Had I heard of skull and bones? Well, I hadn't, except as pirate insignia. Well, these are the real pirates, he said. It's a secret society. Have you ever really looked at the architecture of Yale, how demonic it is? This is far more than frat boy hijinks. Somebody's all written a book, already written a book about it, he told me. America's secret government. But nobody's read it, or if they have, they don't want to talk about it, because it's a secret. Pretty much suppressed by the mainstream media. This was long before I'd ever heard the phrase conspiracy theorist or given it a second thought. These rich and powerful bloodline families were plotting to undermine Western culture and governments and put in place a totalitarian state on Marxist socialist lines. And maybe, maybe that's where he lost me, because it, it seemed to make no philosophically compatible sense. Plus, he was becoming a bit too wild-eyed and conspiratorial himself, and I had a few too many more urgent personal issues I was dealing with at the time. Then, then one day he turned up, even more wild-eyed, dishevelled and conspiratorial than ever, took me aside in whispers and told, told me he had two visitors the previous night, wielding baseball bats and threatening him with a lot more than literary censorship. I, I guess I decided this is too much of a paranoid nut job, too frenziedly damn serious to be offering me any further camaraderie or cosily philosophical enlightenment. It's like his, his brain had become overloaded, suffocated his mind and put his whole sense of well-being into top-down spin. So I found a different coffee shop to hang out in and I never saw him again. Though I did find myself gazing up at Yale Tower gargoyles with, with a little more studied fascination. I never gave him much of a second thought for several years till, till a friend sat me down to watch a David Icke video. Secret societies. The New World Order, some bells were ringing. He, he even mentioned Skull and Bones, and some of the slide visuals alongside him flashed me back to Yale's gargoyles, and suddenly I'm wondering what happened to my wild-eyed paranoic. I'm seeing dots before my eyes, and the rest is my own alternative history and revised theory. What really brought me to America? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll? battling authority by avoiding it at the same time falling for its seductive prescriptions, the enemy providing the weapons to defeat yourself, the mind games, every war you thought you'd won, you'd actually lost, my sense of self reduced to egotistic outbursts, misunderstood fits of vanity, as rebellion against some status quo facade that in truth had me by its spectaculars. If you don't even know your own self, you will always be working for somebody else's state of your own mind. The problematic challenge of believing something is not believing somebody else doesn't. And considering that relationship breaker with most of humanity, you could be on your own, kid, or you may have to join a different cult. Was I in danger of becoming all wild-eyed, disheveled, and too damned frenzied, conspiratorial, paranoid, serious for my own good? And what about those baseball bats? I still lived in New Haven. I should thank God nobody's listening to me anyway. Of course, of course, any conspiracy theorist worth their salt would have to consider this kid from Lemington Spa maybe part of the conspiracy. 
Once, once, once you go through the looking glass, down the rabbit hole, drink the Kool-Aid, keep shaking the kaleidoscope reality, fractures into ultra MK monkey nuts. This guy is just too cocksure of himself for your own good. He knows too much. The best way to know something is a hoax is to be part of the hoax. I mean, what is he so unafraid of in these times of plague, pontificating and chuckling away in his cosy domicile on the Isle of Wight? Maybe he still works for the BBC. Channel 33 off the official tax-funded broadband te tells you what the answer is and denies any responsibility for you not believing it. Assertion and deniability at the same time. You're on your own, kid. Definitely deep cover MI6. The Tavistock Institute, Chatham House. I'm just here to give you the information. Aldous Huxley gave us Huxley gave us the information. George Orwell gave us the information. George Bernard Shaw, H. G. Wells, Mark Twain, insider information. Maybe even Donald Trump, consciously or not, put there to rattle the cage. Boris Johnson, maybe not the buffoon he makes himself out to be. It's it's all part of the plan to keep us guessing. It takes a wise man to infiltrate a mass of fools. There's honor among conspirators. They're sworn to deceive in plain sight. It's a game of chess. Ask any free pass master mason. These days, these days, they seem like they've upgraded to non-Fabian speed chess. They've upped the ante for lying through their teeth while solemnly accepting and sympathetically shrugging off responsibility in the same breath. Uh, let's see if you can save your own monarch butterfly because pretty soon it's going to be checkmate and all your caterpillar hedge funds are off. David Ike's just there. He's just there for that common hail fellow well met touch. Just say no to drugs, rip off your mask, give your granny a big, big hug, and these tyrants will just crumble under the weight of popular opinion. True love and Bing Crosby and bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover, and we'll all be safe when they're back from over there, and little Jimmy can go catatonic in his own little bed again and pull the other leg. It's got a microchip in it. He's hardly common as muck. I mean, he's already far above the herd. He's just raking it up for the final implant. He goes, now, now we know exactly who's with us and who's against us. Anybody who logs into David Icke are on our radar, tracked and traced as an enemy of the state. And the pyramid is going to roll right over you. You want to be human? We'll show you what it means to be human in an inhuman world. You think we came here on a tourist fucking visa? No, escaping your horoscope. It's written in the stars, which are really Elon Musk satellites beaming down frazzling 5G frequencies into your already clouded brains. It's a thought. It's a thought for a conspiratorial night of Malta. Paranoia strikes deep in the heartland. In the possibly paraphrased words of Cahil Gabrim, maybe he was a fucking Freemason too, to experience God as love, first your heart must break. And we're the ones going to help you break it. Confusion is key to divide and conquer. We're going to show you the way out and tell you the door's locked at the same time. We've covered all our databases. Now we're ready to pounce. Who are we? Well, that's the greatest secret. We are that love that's decided not to speak its name till the whole world is primed for Netflix. Not even David knows, just thinks he does. He knows only what we told him in his job description. You either love your mysterium or you don't. But trust us, you were never meant to figure it out. Just die trying and be reborn in the light of no mysteries to be solved anymore. If you're lucky and we've given you an A for effort, you'll graduate into utter oblivion. Makes perfect sense if you follow the right rationale that nothing will be left to your imagination and all your worries will be over. The ultimate in preventative care. We'll be making our own babies from now on. No more dirty diapers for you or anybody anymore. Sometimes those seeds that refuse to grow need a good transplanting. You know, I've never, I've never really envied anybody. I've, I've thought this through. I mean, I've been jealous of somebody's, their looks, their skill, their talent, their apparent power and means to express themselves, but I've never gone green enough to want to take it away from them. Because if I couldn't have it, <laughs> if I can't have it, neither can you, or anybody else if it comes to that crunch. Any bit of jealousy in me always counteracted by appreciation and inspiration that somebody could do that. 
And I knew I needed that in my life. Somebody's doing something they just love to be good at. Even dentists, though, how much love comes into that, you'd have to ask them not. Sure, they're following their own blueprint or just mastered somebody else's. There's skill, there's invention, and there's creativity, all having their place in making the world a joy to live in. Of course, there's also skillful deception, inventive duplicity, and creative destruction and evil genius that can convince you it's for your own good, invent you a catchy mantra to live or die by while destroying your peace of mind, recreate you a fear-filled shell of yourself. Maybe they envy your peace of mind so much they want to pull it to pieces. If there is a Christian God, let's, let's hope it's a jealous God, not an envious one. Oh, that could be a real problem. In, in the paraphrase words of Joe Stalin, as filtered through Hawkeye Pierce, mass suicide, before you even know you're killing yourself, is painless. Especially if you have nothing of yourself left to lose, sold to the highest bidder, all those layers and layers of yourself you didn't want to peel back in case you found yourself no longer an onion at all opted for any psychotropic drug that gives you an aversion to peeling onions, not creatively, but at least inventively avoiding yourself. Selfless, not being selfish, the highest accolade or the lowest common denominator. Emotional blackmail is the key to getting the job done, you selfish fucking bastard. Aren't we all in this together? Tell that to the trillionaire next door but one world over. Sex, self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice is key to building this world back better. Could be in the Communist Manifesto, never thought it was in the American Constitution. Never crossed my mind, I'd have to collectivise my mind by government mandate and Monty Python has commandments from the top that, that would make the parrot sketch look like rational dialogue between Joe Biden and Bugs Bunny, not a laughing matter at all. Maybe. It's the same people who didn't find Monty Python funny who are now acting out its best bits. With a face so straight and symmetrical, you can't even see it anymore. Comedy just cannot compete with itself anymore. As this real thing unfolds, every contradiction a state of the art update. And that's all there is to it, folks. Makes you either laugh or cry, your choice. Maybe the only choice we have left. Humor is not an option, it's a requirement. Tell that to this Australian comedian, Steve Hughes, who spent much of his adult life trying to turn insanity into a comedy routine. Finished up having a nervous breakdown and addicted to antidepressants, but, but it was hellishly funny while it lasted. I've always, I've always been an avid proponent of physician, heal thyself. Just don't try to heal me when I'm not even sure I'm sick. To put your life into seriously wounded hands, some doctor who's unhappy with their life and could definitely be experiencing unconscious bias, always expecting the worst and determined you should share in it. So we'll all be sacrificed together. Anybody who works in objective absolutes could, could be a threat to your own subjective self. As soon as somebody starts telling you what you need to believe, whether you believe it or not, and not offering sufficient non-emotive evidence to convince you, could, could be a clue. Somebody's got something more than your well-being on their mind. Eliminating any self-respect you have left. If you don't know and respect your own self, essentially, you know and respect nothing, but what somebody else tells you is respectable and on a need-to-know basis. I remember, I remember reading somewhere that fairly early in his career, and Mick Jagger was directed to think of himself as Lucifer. They were filming live. Every time he raised his arm, he was told another section of this studio will go dark. So by the end of the song, he, he'd be alone in spotlights. He was painting the world black. He really liked that idea, he took it to heart. And the rest is mainstream rock and roll history. Meanwhile, the Beatles were singing, she's got the devil in her heart. Maybe she was a big Mick Jagger fan, learning from the best, the whole world, learning from the best. Hey, temptation was never famous for not being tempting. If we can't all be in the spotlight, Enough to be in the presence of the Lord. One Lord or another, blind faith. Eric Clapton is God. Just a sweet soul who loved to play the blues. Battled with heroin, the devil's drug of choice. To keep you under its spell. There was another 
Vietnam veteran, 50 years on. Enlisted early 1964, before the drugs, just the sex and rock and roll, on leave in Saigon. Army called it R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. The GIs called it I&I, &I, intercourse and intoxication. Brings a reminiscent twinkle to his lips. Most of it was hell, he admits, but he'd do it again for the camaraderie and to beat the commies, of course. And it's his story, he's sticking to it. The lily no. Patriotism is the last resort before you go to the gulag. Hey, if you wanna watch, if you wanna watch, if you wanna watch a really bad movie, I recommend a recent Netflix opus, Wonder, with an A, not an O, set in some remote borderline desert reservation township called Wonder, with an A, not an O, though it's a wonderful sampling. <laughs> it's a wonderful sampling of what shit good actors can get themselves into if either the money's good enough or it's in their contract stipulation. Sorry, Tommy. Sorry, Tommy, it's in your contract. Three movies a week for the next 30 years. Do you know how old I am, Harvey? Maybe it's time to retire on me laurels. Well, you know, you know how many dying, demented, geriatric fathers are turning up in scripts these days? It'll rebuild your career, Tom. And all you have to do is sit in a wheelchair in a nursing home or lie on a hospital bed. It's called method acting. You become what you're not even pretending to be. But this one, Tommy, this one could be a fully erect swan song. You get to play a wild geriatric redneck, gone hipster, podcasting conspiracy theorist, apparently a good guy who turns out to be the dark-suited villain. Spoiler alert, though, if after 20 minutes you haven't already been alerted to something rotten in the state of movie-making, maybe you need to find a new career, new career taking everything you're given on face value. It's Tommy Lee Jones and, and this guy Aaron Eckhart with a, a bevy of ludicrously puppet string supporting character actors and hundred dollar a day extras and an authentic, if somewhat operatically overproduced Native American soundtrack to set the sacred earth mystery tone. This enterprising duo co-host a conspiracy podcast from a trailer and a tent in the middle of nowhere. Now that's what that's what it says on, on the sign at the entrance to their desert driveway. If you blink, if you blink with any look, you miss the hokey jokey, eh? In the middle of no the devil's in the details. Mr Eckhart, wild eyed, dishevelled, overwrought his scruffy paranoia as an ex detective traumatized by the not so accidental car crash that killed his young daughter and left his wife catatonic with which the actress plays with supreme aplomb not a plum part but she's a pro as aaron plunges deeper and deeper into his righteous mental distress to find out the truth and who's responsible for it he's lured to wonder he's lured to wonder with an a not an o under false pretenses discovers a basement laboratory in which abducted immigrants are being experimented on with implants that will explode if they try to escape. Of course, before he can reveal this fiendish plot to the world, he's set up, he's framed for murdering the total population of Wanda with an A, I don't know, I'd say four of them tops. He's incarcerated and realises he himself has been implanted. And in an unsublime one flew over the cuckoo's nest moment, he rips it out, frees himself to spend the rest of his life in a lunatic asylum, implicitly among all the other gone wacko, wild-eyed, smock, ghostly conspiracy theorists. Because whoever is running the show, along with Tommy Lee, is obviously too smart for everybody else's good. And if anybody goes looking for the truth, we'll finish a pawn corpse or patsy which was that faux podcasting duo's code for the fate of righteous paranoics, now proved to be a truth. Could set a popular benchmark blueprint for all would-be conspiracy theorists, and maybe that's what this ludicrously overfunded capital investment was all about. Though now I'm being paranoid, eh? Don't bogart that Kool-Aid, Alice. My fantasy's wearing off. We are. We are the hollow men. The stuffed men whispering together, as quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass, under the twinkle of a fading star, between the ideology and the reality falls the shadow. This 
is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a lousy movie. As the Rolling Stones play and sing over the credit roll, then blackout. Innocents were being murdered in that place. I saw it with my own eyes. And I heard those voices never again. Never again. Again and again and again. It's the art of telling lies. You either believe it or you don't.